The coast is where a lot of magic happens. The eco that salt water creates is pretty raw. That complex part that's so appealing and that there's life everywhere. Redfish definitely embody the survivor. I mean, they were heading towards extinction. You have 14 anglers who come together in Houston, Texas, and say, we got to make a difference because they cared about that species. They loved catching it, eating them, taking their kids fishing. All the things that bring people to the coast, they didn't want that to go away. And it's kind of a fabled story. There's a great Japanese saying is never lose your beginner spirit. It started with my dad taking me fishing. Maybe every one of those types of stories start that way. Three-year-old Snoopy Rod fishing in Port Aransas and just being all in immediately. As I got a little older, I was fortunate that my dad would hire guides and that changed everything for me because I had no conception that you could actually make a living doing this. I was like, I want to be a fishing guide. And so was in college and was fortunate to have some guides that were sort of mentors and they would send me overflow trips. I'm getting paid and I'm fishing. I'm like, I'll live in my truck if I have to. I did it full time and just woke up on fire every morning for it. That's what fueled my passion for conservation. You're wading through these seagrass flats and, and you're getting to see the resource, you're getting to see the redfish, but also everything around surrounded. You know, everything from mullet to oysters to stingrays, all of it. You know, it's all intertwined, all of it's connected. And I mean, this little, there he is. That is a healthy redfish right there. The tail's gorgeous. If you show up in Rockport, Texas, or Port Aransas, or Galveston, you're gonna look and you're gonna see the estuary, the marsh, the off-colored water. That's the breadbasket. That's life. And strangely, it's all connected that careful blend of salt and fresh that makes oysters thrive and shrimp thrive and redfish thrive. There's just so much to get excited about redfish. Often they spawn during hurricane season. The large, mature redfish, they go offshore and they get these big balls of them where literally the water will turn orangish red when they're up on the surface. There's lots of big inflows with big tides, big winds. And all of that spawn gets blown into the bays and goes up into the estuaries to grow. And so tiny redfish become bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, they move back offshore to spawn. But the problem is, when you got a bunch of giant redfish up on the surface and you got humans around, we're going to figure out a way to catch them. East Texas boy, I fell in love with the coast. I'm Troy Williamson, and um, I practice law in Corpus Christi, Texas. First time I caught a redfish, I, I was hooked. <laughs> a jerk on both ends of the line. 
In the early 1970s, most people were happy to go to a restaurant and have a fine fish dinner of redfish. If you take yourself back to the 70s, you had this big black and redfish craze, and it became a very popular food fish. The other problem is, is they're fairly easy to target when you're using destructive gear like gill nets, so monofilament entanglement nets. Through the 70s, it really became acute. The population just got beat down enough that, that recreational anglers were really noticing it. Most people just saw the nets in the water, the dead fish hanging on them, large catches of fish. It was a group of people that saw what was happening to the, the resource. You have 14 recreational anglers that are disgruntled. They'd be on a school of fish, come back the next day to find a gill net that's gonna wipe out that entire school. That's a... <laughs> Too damn many commercial fishermen and uh, not enough resource to go around for them. They immediately realized that to change trajectory of a species that's being over harvested, you've got to affect policy. And they were gonna have to work with the Texas legislature. At the beginning, it was not a popular issue. And it took a lot of concentrated effort and it took a lot of money to sway the legislators. 1977, the first protection was the Red Drum Conservation Act, and it set bag limits after a couple of years. House Bill 1000 made redfish illegal to sell them commercially. When the the nets were supposed to come out of the water. The commercial folks were still resisting it. People were having their lives threatened. Those folks that were extremely active in lobbying efforts, uh, Ron Young, Dickie Ingram, Jim Atkins, Jim's cabin, floating cabin, the church, was burned down. He was letting the game wardens used the church as a place to stay. And the church, of course, got its name because when the guys would go fishing on Sunday or stay down here, they were going to church. <laughs> <laughs> the commercial fishermen, if they're going back to Corpus, they're coming through this hole right here. At night, it was like a rodeo. The game wardens who were chasing commercial fishermen who were still outlaw fishing, you know, the fish were disappearing. And uh, there were a lot of guys that uh, didn't want to see that happen. Even after the passage of House Bill 1000, the state of the fishery and the ecosystem, it was dire. The next year, there was a huge freeze and further decimated the redfish and trout. When something's being extracted that significantly, it's the thing that you didn't see coming that gets it. One little environmental blip, and then it's gone. And so you had such a degradation of redfish populations. The importance and the vision and the technology for hatcheries really came into focus. Although commercial aquaculture of red drum has just begun, Considerable information exists about fingerling production of this species because of extensive efforts to restock depleted populations of red drum in natural waters. In Texas, there are three facilities associated with this stock enhancement program. Two of them are hatcheries, and the third is to grow out facility where they have ponds to raise the fingerlings. My name is Shane Bonneau, and I work for Coastal Conservation Association, the Texas chapter, and I'm the advocacy director for the state of Texas. Isn't this cool? I mean, it's like a, a brewery for redfish. Every redfish tank has five fish, three females, and two males. So each year, about 15 million redfish get released, and 15 million spotted sea trout get released. 
The first redfish that were released in Texas were in 1983 that came out of the facility out of Corpus Christi and released into Port O'Connor. There had been a lot of laboratory research conducted in between the late 70s all the way up to 1981 when the gillnet bin went into place. So you kind of had these things happening and coming together at the perfect time to allow for the farming of redfish to take off. The fish are put on photothermal cycles. So you manipulate the t water temperature and the daylight hours. And as long as they are, are well fed and you're taking care of them or not stressed out, you can spawn them for several months at a time. I mean, this is perpetual. I mean, now you feel really good about this species, among others, being here long after we're gone. Fish are sourced from the wild. Fish are spawned indoors, and then the brood stock and the larvae are released back into the wild. The first fish released into our Texas bays happened in 1983. By putting those, those small redfish in the bays, in the estuaries, even though there weren't a lot of mature spawners, they were able to restart that life cycle. That's a really neat moment. They proved you could take a concept in a lab and then scale it up to a commercial level production and not only release fish into the wild for fisheries enhancement, but also prove that you could do this for a commercial scale to get food to the market, you know, for table fare. It's something like that that many, many years later ends up ushering in as aquaculture evolves that, wait a minute, you can have commercially sold red drum. They just have to be raised in an aquaculture facility. It's ironic, if people hadn't been interested in eating them, they wouldn't be as in good a shape now. Only humans could come up with that. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that we ate them to the point that now we've ensured their future. And so it's kind of funny to think about that. You know, the cliche of the end being the beginning, but it kind of is. You know, the Texas redfish recovery and the conservation story behind it, it's not only motivational to people, in other regions, but it actually, it gave them something that they could emulate. And, and that model still plays out today across the U.S. A lot of species have a culture. And maybe it's like all good conservation stories. The culture that started in Texas with Red Drum ends up making it really come to fruition. And then it's a culture that maintains it. The redfish, it's everywhere. It can be at a jetty in 30 feet of water, and it can be in three inches of water, where you don't even understand how something with gills could even live. And the way you target that species changes with that. Putting a long rod in a sand spike, throwing a fly in super shallow water. They all love the brute force of that fish, the durability of that fish. Texas is known as the redfish state. Our fishery was built on the success of the recovery of the redfish species. I've heard from a lot of people through the years that they were one of those 14. But in the end, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who was there because it's really much more important of what they created and how many people are focused on issues like that now. There is no doubt Texans value the coast and Texans have an approach to coastal resources that is a never say die. Even in some of the most challenging issues we face, we continue to strive for good conservation. Redfish are the same way. No matter what challenges they face, be it through passes and through marshes and through everything in between, 
they don't ever give up. They keep going. You can change whatever you want in the eco, they're still gonna try to make their way offshore. And I think maybe that makes them uniquely Texan in their own special way. Thank you.